Yes. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the second installation in the November talks. Uh, today we have Armin Tahar of Group Work Architects. Um, I'm sure you'll be all familiar with his work, um, or at least that studio's work, particularly 15 Clark and Well Close. Um, the November talks is a series uh, supported by the Stowe Foundation, who have been supporting um, educational projects in architecture for the last 15 years around the world. Um, before we get started to those online, you can put questions into the chat and we can read them out. Um, for those in the audience, we have roving microphones. Um, so after uh, Armin's talk, we'll be uh, putting questions over to you and indeed myself for a conversation about the lecture. Um, I'm not gonna give Armin too much of an introduction because I think his work speaks for itself. Uh, his, his, his lecture is titled The Measure of Architecture and um, he's gonna be talking about the ethical framework which architects negotiate to pursue their practice. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over uh, to Amin and just share the screen. Apologies, two seconds. The way we should, yes. Oh, sorry, I've just lost the zoom. No, it's got to be my bad. More. There we go. There we go. Okay. Thank you very much, Armin. You want to? Oh, yeah, yes. <clears throat> yep. Okay. So the title. <clears throat> I've got an hour, so I'll try and um, rattle through these because uh, I've got a feeling they'd take about an hour and a half. But um, if I rattle too fast. Just ask me afterwards. So the title of the um, talk is takes its name from um, Protagoras. So this is 4, 450 BC. Protagoras um, was uh, what we call a natural scientist. Um, and he quickly found in his definition, his structuring of what he saw as science to his students. His students were taking this as um, law, immutable laws. Um, uh, and he changed, he swapped over from, from science to ethics and effectively law as a result of that. Uh, so this is something that's attributed to him. Uh, effectively means that um, uh, in his, uh, as it's attributed to him, there is no objective truth. Everybody perceives the world around them and we have to negotiate those perceptions. Uh, why, is it, why, why does he draw ethics into that? So. Uh, if we have to uh, think of some practical examples from that period, he would argue that uh, we might share the sowing of seeds, we might um, uh, have to negotiate um, um, at what period we actually harvest those. Is it that week, the following week, a few weeks later, uh, we might, that work and, and that product, we might have to negotiate afterwards. Some of that negotiation is reasonably straightforward. We subdivide the product by counting it, it's fairly easy to negotiate that, but there are other areas of perception that are hard to negotiate, and perhaps we oughtn't to negotiate at all. They have no ethical uh, uh, purpose. So for instance, uh, walking out in the weather, you and a friend might walk out in the weather together and you quickly find that one of you is cold and the other one's warm. It is not your position to tell your friend to put on their coat or take off their coat. Uh, so. The measure of, um, of, uh, of all things, uh, uh, in this case, the measure of architecture, how do we apply that to architecture? What's the, what's the connection with architecture? Um, uh, well, we could, we could argue that what areas are we to negotiate between us, whether we're architects or in the building industry? Um, like, well, to be very prosaic, we could start off, well, a building shouldn't really fall on top of your head. So we can make a rule that um, buildings ought to stand up, but for how long should they stand up for, for 100 years, 200 years? Well, we've agreed apparently that 70 years is about right before they have to be um, uh, investigated. Uh, similarly for um, uh, uh, weatherproofing, we want them to be possibly weatherproof if we're all sharing their use, uh, the heat loss, uh, the heat gain, fire and all the rest of it. These are areas that we're definitely negotiating between us. And in the same way that Protagoras would argue, at what point is it an ethical position for us to begin to argue that you should be following one dress code, as it were, for your building than another? He would argue not. 
Uh, so really, that's the introduction to 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 um, to to sort of, if you like, an ethical framework. Um, um, that and um, why do I bother asking? Why do? Why is this a question? Because my suggestion is that actually, for for probably about two hundred and fifty years, we've sort of got ourselves stuck into the idea that it is all about the surface image. That architecture is about the the image. This is how we judge architecture, how we understand it, as opposed to um, um, uh, the other parts, how it stands up, what it's made of, the physical elements that are possible to negotiate. And why is that? Why do we struggle with that? Because fundamentally, we don't get educated that way, especially nowadays, it's even worse than it was when I first started studying. Uh, another class classical reference, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling in disparate classical references that we'll, we'll sort of conclude on uh, later on. Uh, this is uh, uh, animal, if you can see it. I'm not sure from any distance you can see it, but I'll try and um, explain it. Animal laborans and homo faba. So uh, animal laborans basically means animal labor, uh, direct translation. And the classical reference is that this is the work of beasts of burdens. It's mindless, it's repetitive. Uh, there's no creative thought in it. While uh, homo faba is man the maker, uh, it's more creative. Uh, you, uh, it's a classic, direct classical reference. It's, it's Roman. It's uh, you know, 100 years after Protagoras. Uh, and it's more about you, the man, the, the uh, mankind, the tool maker, able to liberate themselves, uh, determine, your own, determine your own future. Now, this is uh, 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 picked up again in the Renaissance period and, um, and also in the sort of mid 20th, 20th century. We have Hannah Arendt on the left for whom the two are separate. So animal laborans and uh, possibly because it's sort of uh, in uh, post-industrial or rather industrial, it might be a bit Marxist orientated that uh, repeated labor has no creativity in it. While homo faber is about uh, uh, self-determination and uh, the creative, creativity that um, uh, benefits us as um, a community. Her student is uh, Richard Sennett on the right. And forgive me if um, you know this is this is the equivalent of, an, uh, of um, a social social scientist putting one slide up uh, of Corbusier in a modern building and saying that's modernism. So I'm afraid I've sort of encapsulated this in one slide. Um, uh, uh, for, for Richard Sennett, the two are actually overlapping. So Richard Sennett is a, a, a um, concert level trained um, cellist, and for him, the training of being a cellist is 10,000 hours, 10,000 hours of labor, re repetition. There's no creative creativity in it. And he applies that in the same way as um, all of us learn architecture or any other skill. There are years, if you like, of, of, of graft before it becomes a skill, before you improvise and before you innovate, before any creativity can occur. So the, the uh, animal laborans is the how, if you like, and the, the, the homo faber is the why. And for Richard Sennett, the two can overlap, uh, that to distinguish the two, that um, um, hard labor or if you write repetitive labor is not connected to, to, to the why, is to diminish those who do, um, if you like, the, the repetitive work. Uh, and we'll come to that in a second. So hold those two ideas of Protagoras, um, a sort of classical idea of, of uh, uh, animal laborans and homo faber. Our first uh, 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 proto-historian, art, art and architecture historian, is Giorgio Vasari. Now, uh, he published the most excellent artists, architects, and sculptors, uh, mid-16th century. He put himself amongst them. He was an architect and an artist. Uh, uh, but for him, and the critical point here is that for him, each of these were young apprentices. And you have to remember, if you're um, if you're a member of the aristocracy, there's absolutely no way you needed to become an apprentice. Why would you go and put yourself into an apprenticeship where you have to do the hard labor, as it were, in cabinet, uh, in timber working, stone masonry, etc., before you got anywhere near potentially becoming a sculptor or an architect? If you weren't middle class and a, a, and uh, uh, your parents able to push you towards these apprenticeships and have that social capital to in, uh, put you in 
you didn't have a chance either. So there's a there's a group of people, apprentices, who, who, who enter these fields that Vasari tracks from their youth uh, uh, through their training until they become most excellent. But he identifies them each as individuals. So the, the, uh, he has a debate at the time with his contemporaries that uh, the, the difference between style and manner is manner is attributed to the individual. It is idiosyncratic to the individual skill, how that individual has been taught, how they've interpreted that teaching, uh, what else they bring to it, and then obviously the skill that develops is specific to them. It is not a, a taxonomy, as it were, an, an umbrella label that is style. And that lasts for about 200 years until Johann Winkelmann, who is an academic, he goes on the ground tour, and uh, unlike other people on the ground tour, he's actually, this is the Enlightenment period, he applies rationality to what he's looking at. He maps out archaeological digs, so he becomes, uh, he starts the discipline of archaeology as well as art history as we know it today, in terms of putting a specific period to everything he finds and putting it in a sort of order, uh, a chronological order. While Vasari is interested in the manner, the skill development, Winkelmann is interested in, in taxonomy and larger um, 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 context of, 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 of that. Uh, so the difference really is Vasari's interest in the verb uh, 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 and, uh, and, and Winkelmann the noun. And my uh, suggestion is that we've been stuck with it ever since. The product, as it were, comes before the process. So Vasari is talking about each individual has this process that produces this product that makes them excellent. And then come and simply saying, here is a product that is uh, uh, um, uh, common to a whole social group, a social history, and the process is completely, um, um, to some degree, ignored. And evidence of that is, of course, Vinkelman is, is digging up um, 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 statues and, um, uh, and surveying uh, uh, buildings that bleached, bleached of their polychrome um, uh, originality. And in his... Um, in his second, because his first book is quite best, uh, is a bestseller. In his second book, Opinions of, uh, which effectively starts in the neoclassical age, he, he posits that white marble, white statues, white um, uh, uh, buildings are um, uh, emblematic of the, of the uh, because of the, 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 he's, he's mostly in love with the Greek, but he conflates the idea of Greek democracy with what he's seen, the whiteness of the marble. Um, and uh, uh, essentially starts in the neoclassical age that way. And everyone carries on believing that well into the Victorian period where they're even, you know, as some of you probably know, trying to scrub, scrub any color they find on the Elgin marbles uh, to counter this idea that there was a polychrome past. Successfully lasts until you, we know that um, Schinkel becomes quite exemplary of the neoclassical age. Schinkel is actually sent by the Prussian crown prince to England to investigate the, the building of, of um, British Museum. A Prussian Crown Prince is looking to eventually build uh, museums on the Museum Insel, of which Schinkel completes one. While he's on his tour, because uh, after looking at the museum and, and its plans, he, he tours the rest of um, England, Scotland, and actually Wales. And he's absolutely fascinated. In fact, he, he writes, he's quite dumbstruck that the England is industrializing quite rapidly. And there's just architecture being born, architecture being born out of utility, architecture that's formed from bricks, stone, uh, timber, the composite of, of all those plus wrought iron and cast iron, uh, a new architecture as it were of an industrial age. Uh, and on his return, he asks um, uh, uh, Bertica and eventually Semper takes over. So Bertica is on our right. Karl Bertica and Godfrey Semper on our left. Uh, what are the origins of, of the neoclassical architectures that we do, that we, that we um, uh, you know, the motifs that we uh, redraw, we rebuild? Uh, what is its relevance to what we're doing today? If England is managing to, to, to give birth to an architecture, that's quite informal. Um, and Bertica essentially, uh, and, um, and, and, and Semper, um, um, essentially, it's probably easier if I go to the next one. Schwazi does the more um, uh, clean, um, explanatory drawing. 
So this is Choisy in France, who's also investigating the same themes. Essentially, essentially what's happening is this constant crisis of what are we drawing? Why are we drawing this two-dimensional stuff? Where, where, where are its origins? And what relevance does it have to us today? Because ultimately they're not trained to, to, to be craftsmen as, as in Vasari's period. They're all trained to be drawers. They're drawing, 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 and eventually asking themselves, what the hell are we drawing? Uh, and Schwazi, uh, uh, Bertica and Semper, top down discover that actually the architecture is born of the materials you make it with. Uh, this is Schwazi's diagram that explains that uh, the, the classical motifs and uh, uh, ornamentation have their origins in tectonics. Tectonics is, um, if we go back a slide, is something that uh, Bert on our right-hand side is, uh, is defining. So tectonics, the making of, of uh, bringing together of materials to form your architecture. And Bertica initially, he's the first to define the idea of can form and kunst form, the structure and the ornamentation, uh, which then Gottfried Semper uh, defi uh, further defines in terms of the, bind the joining, binding, and completion of architecture. So what he says is you bring bits of timber together, bits of timber and stone or whatever the materials there are, you might bind them together. And the completion is when that ornament, when, when that um, process, tectonic process becomes um, um, emblematic of a cultural in, uh, institution that's repeated again and again and becomes therefore emblematic of a culture. So the question is what's emblematic of the modern age as it were? Uh, uh, um, not the neoclassical, Schinkel, as some of you probably know, uh, reverted to um, the neo-Gothic uh, revival, as did so many others in the Victorian age, because they're all grasping what is emblematic of the modern age. I mean, fascinatingly, Gottfried Sempo uh, was exiled in, um, in London during um, failed um, German uprisings with Marx, and Marx is in the British Library, writing away, and Semper is in the British Museum, observing and with his insights, but he's actually also working for Paxton. So he's working at Paxton's um, great exhibition on various pavilions within it, and obviously looking around himself that this is the new architecture, but still they're grasping away. And most, most results are the Gothic revival because the Gothic at least has structure that's uh, uh, expressed as it were, the tectonics are expressed. But we have, um, so uh, 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 Guri, on the, on the left, Semper, Owen Jones, Ruskin and Morris all asking those same questions. Ruskin and Morris, Morris beginning to try and stitch in together this idea of, um, of ethics, the, the, um, the um, um, animal laborans and the homo faber that we were talking about earlier. Today, I don't know if any of you, how many of you know Edward R. Ford? Uh, um, not expecting to call out, I do, but... Um, and maybe we'll talk about it later. So Edward Ford is today doing the same thing as they are, um, um, running through what we're building and defining those details. And in his opinion, out of these details, two of them are legitimate, the rest aren't. So if we start with the top left, um, uh, the pretense of no detail at all. If you were making a surfboard at a certain scale, this would work but clearly a building of a certain scale where you're pretending it's as if it is a monocoque structure, uh, in his opinion, is, is, is illegitimate, it's, it's false. Uh, detail as motif where it has no origins in tectonic, but pretends to have, uh, is also legitimate. I mean, it's obviously quite controversial because he's using examples that most of us celebrate, including Mies, where a failure of using tectonics is actually then um, uh, faked by applying what, 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 what you had wished for. While the last two, the detail is joint, articulated joint, where you're expressing the actual way that they come together in the same way that Semper would uh, uh, describe, and the autonomous detail where at a certain scale, those details um, uh, have no relevance to the overall structure, but they might um, uh, underline a theme in the architecture. I'm gonna rattle through this though, because um, uh, it's sort of extraneous, but it's sort of, ex uh, it, well, let me just get on with it. Um, Otto Wagner is, is, is effectively in the world of Semper, and his idea is obviously a secessionist from the Bazaar period and uh, classical ages as, as they understood it. And, and for them, why not express this um, joining, binding, and this is the post office, uh, the top 
top run of um, images. There's Otto Wagner on the left, Post Office Bank, where the cladding system is obviously bolted in. Why not express the, the bolting, as it were, and let the bolting and then become um, 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 decorative ornamentation. And this is his first sort of uh, uh, stab at it. On the bottom is Henri van der Felp, uh, Belgium, who started off in the Art Nouveau um, uh, tradition. And um, his, his uh, way was to strip back. Why not allow the fact that we can build in the strip back way uh, um, to express the emblematic of the modern age? So that's what we would recognize today, I guess, as modernism. Of course, Henry van der Felp was also director of um, School of Art, and he was asked to apply both the School of Art, uh, integrate the School of Art and Applied Arts. Uh, and he did that, but uh, couldn't become director because after the First World War, he was Belgium and in Germany, he wasn't very popular. So he put Gropius in uh, um, initially, Hannes Meyer taking over and then eventually Nice. In that short 13 year period, they're still grasping for what is the modern period. So some uh, emblematic of the modern period, as some of you know, well, that, uh, Gropius initially, uh, some of the early work was, um, you might call arts and crafts, because the Werkbund had picked up from Morris. It had its social purpose, its ethical, ethical social purpose mission, integrated with the applied arts as, as, as Morris had, had wished for. But eventually that, that dropped, and we, we might recognize the emblematic of, of the modern age with this sort of image. And at the same time, uh, we have uh, uh, Frederick de Onis teaching at the bottom right, uh, Lorca, Boonwell, uh, um, and, and Dali, uh, uh, precisely at the same time in, in Madrid. And he's teaching the idea that there is no modern age. We are in a postmodern period. Uh, uh, where does that come from? He's, um, he's, he's in Madrid, uh, and it's... Uh, essentially teaching there is, no mono, there is no monolithic future culture. We should all be, as we are with literature in Spain, uh, able to source from north, south, east, west, the various cultures, the various um, uh, traditional uh, Spanish cultures that might date back pre-Phoenician, the Phoenician, the uh, Roman, Arabic, uh, 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 and later, um, uh, later cultures. So for him, it's the postmodern period already in the 1920s. That isn't adopted. We don't understand it that way. Certainly not in architecture, where we've we've adopted the the sort of Bauhaus, if you like, emblematic image of the modern age, and that's how we understand it. It's disseminated, uh, and that's how we're taught. It's the image, as it were. While well, for Federico de Onis, uh, it's about the sampling, as it were. Understand everything that's around you, and whatever your 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 position, particular at the time, is allow that to influence you and see what, that, what, the, what the result is, the product is. So allow that sort of freedom, free process, open process to influence the, the product. And the product should always vary. Eventually on your left is Ihab Hassan, who's in Milwaukee, uh, another literature academic in the mid seventies, holds a conference called The Postmodern Condition, for which uh, Leotard um, joins and also speaks, is eventually hired by uh, Span uh, Spanish Canadian city to undertake um, uh, some studies on what are the consequences of the postmodern condition for 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 for, for, um, for the state as well as um, cities, and the, that slowly begins to enter the um, culture, I guess just about for architecture. People are already talking about it. Pevsner thinks uh, postmodernism is most, mostly historicist uh, references. But um, uh, Charles Jenks is about to publish a book called New Radicalism, in which Gaudi and others, almost in the Vasari model, individual uh, architects are mastering their own skills. They are not following a taxonomy, a, a, an overall umbrella um, uh, definition. They're just masters of their own um, uh, realm, as it were, uh, 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 processes and excellent products, in Vasari's words. However, just before publishing it, um, he um, changes the title. So from this uh, understanding of postmodernism, because it's obviously been a buzzword for some time, but slowly developing understanding that it's about uh, 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 a non-conformity, not picking up an orthodoxy, not 
following a product and reproducing that product, a derivation of that product, but actually the responsibility for you as an individual to develop your own skills, be open to all influences, whatever they are, and, and, uh, and, and then the product will follow. Instead, it is, uh, we, we have a whole architecture section labeled as postmodern architecture. And of course, and it inevitably what happens is lots of architects fall into, into line and define themselves as postmodernists. And we understand this is how it was taught. I mean, I suspect for a lot of students today, it's not the same, uh, it's not the same anymore, but certainly in my generation and, um, and uh, dare I say, um, up to quite recently it has, and it's still sort of infecting how we treat architecture, uh, teach it as well as understand it, disseminate it, criticize it. And of course, the inevitability is um, one generation after another, we'll just be looking at the images. What, what's the next image? What's the next image? So concluding um, um, with, um, with uh, 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 on that sort of arc, as it were, back to Richard Sennett. Uh, so Richard Sennett's argument is the, the how and the why should overlap. Uh, um, that is, um, uh, you develop your skills, your 10,000 of hours of animal laborans, as it were, developing your skill. Uh, but eventually after that becomes second nature, you, uh, you um, improvise and you innovate. But that needs to be controlled. Um, to what end? To what end are you fantastically skillful and excellent? Um, um, well, his argument is that whether you're a surgeon, a software developer, an architect, Crossman in the sort of artisan sense, or, uh, we, we, uh, we understand. Um, whatever your product is, eventually between us, we will negotiate whether, whether it has a common purpose for common well being. He doesn't say to us how that will occur, but he says, whatever it is, whether it's food or, um, or, or, or any of those other um, uh, skills that I've suggested, between us, we need to negotiate that. And that's where I bring Protagoras back in. Because his point is, yes, some areas we do, do need to negotiate, uh, we should negotiate, and some areas we should well leave alone. And my, my argument is that for, for at least for the last 250 years, we've been doing exactly the opposite. We've been interested in the things that we should leave well alone, the image, the final product, as opposed to concentrating on what actually matters. Uh, so what does matter? Or well, certainly today, you know, if I said sustainability and low embodied carbon, We'd all agree on that, wouldn't we? Uh, but are we in any way skilled to, to pursue that? Probably not, because most of us aren't educated in that way. We have no idea about the materials that we're working with. I mean, I hold up my hands. I graduated. I had ambitions for all this, theoretical ambitions. But how would I implement them? I didn't have a clue. It takes years of practice. But as a practitioner now, I should be able to teach that to others and I hope I can. But the system isn't set up that way. My suggestion is it ought to be, and I was discussing earlier with one of your colleagues um, from the LSA that, um, at least the LSA is sort of back in that tradition where it's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a possibility of that. Okay, right, I'm getting some work now. Um, I'll try and be um, reasonably quick. Okay, so uh, the story of Barrett's Grove is um, uh, in an area of London that, that rapidly developed um, uh, some Georgian, but mostly Victorian, pattern book housing, mass construction, very fast. Well, most of it's still there, quite happily, obviously rebuilt in parts. And our challenge was um, a client who effectively wanted to do the same sort of thing. How is it possible that these people managed to build that, that, that period, managed to build fast, yes, we'll argue whether it's jerry built or not, uh, fast, repetitively, but apparently still has some charm. Well, we'd been looking, we'd been paid actually to do some research by the EU for mass production housing. And they were expecting the usual boxes on top of, stacked on top of boxes, trucked away, prefabricated, the stuff we've been doing for generations and never really doing properly because we realized it doesn't make sense to transport boxes of air everywhere. Flat packed is better. And obviously CLT is better still. Uh, um, obviously there aren't enough, uh, there isn't enough production of CLT at the moment. Uh, if there is a demand, sudden demand as there was for building schools of the future during the Labour um, government, the price of CLT suddenly goes up, it's no longer economical. However, on this project, it was inexpensive. What we realized was that the superstructure can be the internal finish at the same time. If you then disengage 
the superstructure from the envelope, what you look at, because all of us make buildings where we have to hold up all the bricks per floor because that's the convention. We're not taught anything else, um, doesn't occur to us. Uh, I'm not saying we're geniuses, but it just took us some time to work this out. Um, and of course, not independently, you have to do this with your engineer and your subcontractors all working together, posing questions, scratching your head and eventually getting there. Uh, what you're looking at is um, uh, exposed uh, uh, internal superstructure, but the superstructure is the floor plate, the walls and the roof uh, exposed to the interior. Uh, it is not holding up any bricks. If it had to hold up any bricks, just like a steel or concrete frame, it would suddenly increase in size. So that's more material, uh, more carbon as it were, more cost to the client. Bricks have still made to hold themselves up. And this can be over six stories. This is of that sort of scale. It's a half brick wall. The only thing you have to stop it doing is falling into the street. And you can tie that back into the superstructure on flexible wall ties. What that means is that the brick and superstructure, which always wants to move separately, whether it's concrete or steel, is allowed to slip. I mean, you know, I exaggerate by doing this, but it, it's allowed to slip past one another. Um, means there's no expansion joints, there are no weep holes, and obviously none of these excessive amounts of um, uh, anchors and um, wall shelves and all the rest of it. So less material, less structure, quicker on, on site, etc. No internal lining necessary, no plasterboard, etc., etc. So what we found with this is that uh, it saved about 25% of the construction budget. I'm not going to labor or dwell on every project and every aspect of the project, but just pick up certain elements of it. Um, now, obviously, what we learned on this uh, was that uh, the diagram on the left is standard um, subdivision of, um, of, uh, of any development cost, uh, development outcome. And the red item, which says profit, is actually what the bank called their risk money. So should the developer uh, collapse, should the market collapse, it's unlikely to collapse by more than 25%, and therefore they're not left with a site that's got negative equity. All being well, the developer walks away with that as profit after having repaid the bank and all the rest of it. And that, that shows you the subdivision of land value. So if you're the landowner selling it to the developer and all the rest of it, and, they, and, and the construction cost. Here we save 25% of the construction cost. So on the right, you can see what the impact of that is. If we slice off 25% of the construction cost, that adds, adds profit or it makes housing cheaper. But if it's the market, the open market, why would it make it cheaper? You know, if you're the state agent talking to your client, he's not gonna say, well, sell it for 10% cheaper. The client will take that 10%. And of course, that's exactly what they did. So after the, the state agent initially said, you'll never be able to sell these um, Swedish sauna homes, um, you'll have to mark them down. He ended up selling them for more because there are enough people who apparently like Swedish sauna homes. So not only did he save money on the construction costs, he ended up selling them for more. Now, uh, if everybody started working like that, what does that do? The model does not change on the open market. He'd still have 25% risk money, bank risk money, 25% profit. The developer doesn't make any more eventually. The construction costs has come down. All you've done is increase land value. So on the, on the right, uh, hypothetically, if we keep innovating and making construction costs lower and lower unless, until it's next to zero, all you've done is increase land value because the market is the market. It's not totally depressing because obviously if you're working for the public sector and you've got, we, the, the public as it were, own our own land and we encourage our councillors not to sell it all off, uh, uh, change policy to say, actually, we've innovated, we've reduced the construction cost. It means we can borrow less. That means uh, the rents can be less. That's the only way it's going to work. This is not a campaign against the, uh, the private sector. The private sector is what it is. It's got its spots. We're not asking it to change them. By contrast, uh, just as, yeah, by contrast, this is um, uh, 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 an area uh, north, north of Kensington Gardens, red dot, Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens, and essentially an opportunity for an end of an urban block that, um, that uh, councillors, planning departments had highlighted as an opportunity site. And our client had found, we'd worked with for a number of years to study accumulate the sites and look at um, ideas. Um, 
any architect, all of us, I suspect, would plan it exactly the same way. It's a very straightforward site, faces southward across the park, fantastic views, but obviously a great deal of solar gain as a result. Very busy road, noisy road, busy road with buses going past, looking directly into any apartments, as well as um, tube stations and the park opposite, also looking into the apartments. So we've got issues with noise, pollution, uh, solar gain and privacy, which immediately in our plan, I mean, the plan is, uh, has got flat surface north or south, so the dual aspect is fantastic, bedrooms at the back and living rooms at the front, very straightforward. All of us do exactly the same, same um, right, right number of, um, of cores, et cetera. What's it going to look like? We don't know yet. Plan all this out while we're um, uh, uh, planning all that out, all the pragmatic stuff, all of us do. The other thing we do is just a little bit of digging into the neighborhood, uh, social history, find out if there's any reason that it can influence. Sometimes not, sometimes it does. What we found was this neighboring building, which was uh, built by those two architects on the bottom, Muse Davis, who've also built the Ritz Hotel, the RSC Club and various buildings. They were the sort of Norma Foster, I guess, of their day, doing very well. And it was actually built for the um, um, uh, Prince of Wales, Queen Victoria's son, for his lover, uh, who is Lily Langtree. And if you go in there now, it's all the down, upstairs. I think it's been completely um, stripped out, but downstairs is still pr pretty much intact. You'll see a sort of mini proscenium arch and royal box where they she performed and he watched. Um, still there. Uh, one of us had a thought experiment. You know, it's group work. I'm not a dictator. I'm not coming up with endless sketches demanding that they're um, they're done. It's just sort of everyone having various thought experiments and uh, debating them. And one of us had a thought experiment and just presented this. I have completed Muse Davis's scheme um, on the end of the um, urban block, as it were, presented to, presenting to the park. And we thought it was very amusing. It's very interesting. Um, let's look at it in detail, plonked it in all those context drawings that we'd done. And we thought, oh, it looks rather nice, doesn't it? I sort of wish that they had completed it. Um, but it's obviously a fake history, isn't it? It's completely false. You know, this is not real. If we were rebuilding it, we could understand it. Maybe there's a challenge to rebuilding what had been demolished or part demolished. It's entirely fake. It's flawed. It's uh, not a real narrative, um, et cetera. So all these words are coming out during the debate. And it occurred to somebody, the other person working on these um, louvers and bris soleil that would have to keep out the sun, uh, but um, you know, they diminish the views um, uh, downwards into the park, etc. Aha, I've been thinking of what these bris soleil are made of. They're going to be perforated metal of some description. So they become partly a privacy screen, a sort of meshrabia, Arabic meshrabia, that, that, like a net curtain. You know, you can, when you're close to, you can see out, but from a distance, they become, appear solid. How about we make this... Um, this sort of false narrative, this uh, fake imagined past, a ghost shroud. Yeah. So this is where you know, the two ideas um, sort of um, suddenly make sense, if you like. The material suddenly makes um, for us a, a sort of poetic sense. And, and then it's a debate on, well, what is it? Is it actually load bearing? Is it trying to be load bearing? Is it a, a, a sort of ephemeral shroud that slightly shakes? It has to be lifted off the ground. So from a distance, as you approach it, it appears solid. And as you get closer and closer, you realize it's beginning to disintegrate because it's obviously active, depending on who's using what. Uh, and then as you get closer, it's off the ground and clearly um, uh, in a three millimeters of perforated metal uh, ephemeral. Um, and then obviously the views of the, the inhabitants on behind the projected screen, as it were, of this image looking out onto the park. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I can elaborate more where I went. Um, a few years later, we were actually called to, to, to look at a competition for a site that had its part dem demolished or bombed rather during the war. Very, very quick competition, two weeks two or three weeks to come up with ideas. Uh, and it occurred to us, well, we've been thinking about this narrative, the desire for, for um, uh, well, nostalgia. What is nostalgia? Why, why do we have it for, especially for buildings, um, especially for buildings that had been demolished? 
uh, or bombed as a, uh, and rebuilt almost as memorials. In this case, it's a different sort of narrative, but it has the same um, essence. Why don't we um, suggest uh, the idea of a casting? It's a monument because it's something that was once there. It, it um, satisfies our, 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 our sense for nostalgia, but it is a monument and is flawed. So um, I keep, I always repeat that um, um, my, my German is, is that of an eight year old, or seven, eight year old when I left. So um, uh, the German for monument is Denkmal. So my direct translation is, is, is somebody charging you to think, you think, look upon me and think about it as opposed to monument, which is sort of just seems just a, a noun. Um, so we thought, well, actually, yes, why don't we make it a flawed casting? As all monuments are, they are narratives, they're edited narratives. Uh, they're inevitably flawed because they leave out whole sections of, uh, of communal narratives. Why don't we choose a material that is a casting? And then the internal inhabitation is something completely alien, foreign that bursts through. So we have uh, uh, um, essentially a in situ cast material, the sort of terracotta cement mix uh, um, that becomes a twin wall tied together to become load bearing. So that goes all the way up the building across and back down again, within which then span the CLT um, structures, the floor plates, staircases, and then everything else internal is also timber. Partly to balance out the fact that you're using quite a lot of cement for this, um, but also to differentiate what's the inhabited space as opposed to this memory, this flawed narrative. And the floor is deliberately, I mean, we've chosen this material because all of us know if you're working with fair face concrete, it doesn't want to be perfect. Everybody wants it to be perfect, but it never is. You end up always trying to, to, to repair the grout loss and the rest of it. In this, in this case, we, 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 we begged our contractor, please do not repair anything. He didn't believe us because he thought we were going to condemn it. But, so we'd have to be the reg there regularly to make sure these floors are remain. And internally, using anaglypta wallpaper to cast against, so to you know, allude to the Victorian inhabitation pre previously. Here's our interior. Um, again, on different um, different scale uh, a competition in um in uh, in bulgaria we won which is for a metro station so metro stations have metro stations infrastructure have uh, an adopted language it's a competition we have enough time to think well where do we start with this and why will our scheme be different from others why will it be uh, um, uh, challenging the uh, the expectation of what is um, the metro station language because they're already hinting what they want. Well, what are how are how, how are these built? This is a uh, two types of metro building, as it were, tunneling and cut and fill. This is the cut and fill method. So thirty percent or thereabouts of the cut and fill method is temporary temporary work. So if you top left those two piles that come down, you dig down, and as you're digging down, you have to put large amount of steel as you're going down to stop the walls collapsing in. That's all temporary work. So it has to vanish at some point and go elsewhere if it's reused. It's expensive, not only just to buy, install, take away, reuse, uh, 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 but the material itself. Uh, so uh, with our engineer, uh, we occurred to us, well, supposing we just don't dig initially. We just dig a show, um, hollow that is in the shape of the slab that is determined by the depth of the beams that are required, because ultimately this has to have a flat surface for a road to go across. Uh, so that second diagram shows you how that slab, so that earth is hollowed out, a slab is cast, and then the beams are cast into that slab. Then you drop your diggers, and that's effectively your temporary works as permanent works. That immediately tells you, well, actually, that could, that could influence the language of the project. So it's not, it's um, the process of the engineer, the civil engineer and structural engineer, helping us to understand how, how um, these structures are made and us sort of feeding back into that and realizing, well, actually that could be the language of the architecture as well as the, lands the landscape, the landscaping that, uh, that has to be part of them, of this metro bus interchange. So immediately the, 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 the language is of, of um, journeys to the underworld, fissures in this landscaping to get us down there. 
and reflections of this sort of um, subterranean world. I'm rattling through, I'm almost done, Five, seven minutes. Uh, right, the only reason I'm mentioning this project, Caroline Place, which is five bedroom house or thereabouts, it's all stone, stone and um, lots of nice bits of um, timber, uh, uh, stone staircase, yeah. So uh, this is what's called a part cantilevered part reciprocal staircase. Uh, until the mid late eighties, Price and Myers who had discovered, rediscovered, how these staircases were made. So at some point in the post-war period, we just stopped making them like this. Maybe more I'm saying post-first world war period. Um, uh, and using concrete and uh, metal stringers instead. Uh, we, we can sort of discuss why, but um, and people were fascinated. Um, how did these apparently thin pieces of stone uh, hold themselves up? Because they can't all be cantilevered from, 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 the, um, from the wall, which they're not. They're they're set into the wall, so they're, 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 they're firmly set in, but if you pulled one step away, the other one would drop. So what's happening is they're set in, but they're resting on the step and throwing their load down that spiral all the way down to the ground or whichever floor slab they hit, uh, which is all a revelation to us, very fascinating, uh, learn a lot. We learn a lot with stonemasons. Uh, we're using CAD software, which allows the stonemasons cutting tools and um, a routing and cutting tools which are robotic to maneuver themselves while cutting stone and actually reduce the amount of wastage to zero this would have been otherwise 40 50 percent wastage um and leaving the, those marks on there to speak of the subterranean new basement as it were and getting more refined as you get spiral your way to the top of the house and while there uh seeing th this sort of stuff come in again that's a giant block of stone um, um it's interesting, it looks pretty firm. You ask your stonemason, I mean, you know, that's that's pretty firm, it looks like a column. Well, it could be a column. Well, you know, well, why don't we make buildings like this anymore out of, out of, out of columns? Well, we can, I mean, if anybody wanted to, but none of you want to, do you? You, you um, clad everything, don't you? You veneer everything. You know, I don't know how many years I've been in the industry before I hit, heard that I realized he's right. Got the same problem as um, as um, Barrett's Grove in terms of it's normally just held up per floor or on some sort of cladding rails, because nobody asked. Do we? we just take it as read that that's how it has to be? There must be a reason that why we're doing it like this. It must make sense. I'll get to that. Clock and well close. Uh, so nothing had occurred in that area specifically. When I say nothing, I mean no no permanent structures um, until the Norman invasion and uh, one of the companion barons. Barons built um, Augustine in Nunnery and the Priory of St. John, which flourished for 500 years. Top left, Duke of Norfolk uh, uh, dissolved the abbey, took it as his own palace. His son fell out with Elizabeth I, was beheaded. The land was taken from them. The, most of the abbey demolished. Some of it remained. Um, eventually, Oliver Cromwell dissolved the monarchy and uh, took the land again for himself, built himself a nice big house of state, come palace, dictator for life. Land taken from him after his death when the monarchy was restored, building demolished, lots of rebuilding and demolition, clearing. Um, re remains of the abbey pretty much gone. William Morris uh, buys the building next to us, starts the 20th century press. Uh, uh, it's quite a large building, part of it's still left. Marx writes for him, Lenin uses the, um, the, the printing press. It's still the, 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 um, the, the beginning of our May Day marches for Labour Party and other socialist groups. Most of that's demolished, but now the front, build, front of the building is the Marx Memorial Library. Lots and lots of, this is just that sort of social history investigation to see whether anything can influence, bring influence to what we're working on. Interesting for us, we thought, well, you know, it's a long history of radicalism. We know that obviously lots of printing presses in that area, uh, Fleet Street's essentially born from that area. It's, uh, uh, um, and then of course, there's a collapse in confidence in the post-war period here in this particular, particular area. And we find that at some point in the seventies, somebody in the conservation department, well, it's, it's sort of born, isn't it? Uh, one of the first conservation, proper conservation areas, conservation area guidelines. Uh, uh, writes and defines this area as predominantly brick. It was really up to that point, stone, brick, 
bit of leftover bits of timber as well. But effect effectively what happens, it becomes self-fulfilling prophecy and then the entire 70s and 80s, the more and more brick pastiche. And it's not really what we wanted to do. So we were being a bit literal and said we weren't limestone on this site, we were more um, half timber structures. Uh, let's take, we assume we're gonna have a, um, a steel frame building. We assume we're gonna have some sort of unitized glazing system, but unitized glazing systems, once you put them side by side, have big black bits of back baked encapsulated bits of framing if the framing isn't on the outside. Put all that metal together, the steel frame, the steel structure, plus the metal and the frames, give it to our engineer on a self-learning bit of software. What does it suggest? If, we're, if we've got zero metal in the glass, double glazed units, it's an exoskeleton where you need some diagonal bracing that modulates the facade, all very well received. Um, uh, by planners who want to press for, for approval, but he falls out with a new conservation officer who's reading the conservation area guidelines quite literally. And strangely, he, he completely is blind to where it says predominant material uh, uh, brick and decides that actually in his mind it's stone. So we would never investigate it stone hadn't, hadn't, if it hadn't been for this conservation officer waving his um, flag saying, um, please use stone, uh, or otherwise I'll be at a war with, with the case officer. I thought, well, we've got no prejudice against the materials. Let's have a look, see whether we can do it. Obviously, this is how we understand it. It comes back to that whole um, uh, uh, Winkelmann, Semper, uh, Bertica uh, question of what the hell are we building? Why does it matter? Does it have any ethical question? Why does it matter to any of us whether we build like this? Or well, if I just, for brevity, um, say, well, so basically sustainability, you know, um, do all these materials, add it together. Are there, is it greener than um, just having a lump stone? Well, it turns out, of course, it isn't. We were just intuitively thinking maybe 15, 20% saving. And I'll tell you towards the end. So again, we went back to the masons and they said, yes, of course you can build in stone. I mean, give us the volume of stone, use the same software to generate columns and beams. That gives you a full cubic meter rate, it turned out to be cheaper than, uh, than you know, once the QS got that cost back, because the QS had never done it before. He keeps saying um, to us, well, the last stone building I understand, and I, that's our common knowledge to us QSs, is either Finsbury um, Square by Eric Parry, or uh, parliamentary offices were notoriously expensive. You could have clad those in top series BMWs end to end, and uh, it would have been cheaper. Uh, so that's why nobody uses stone. Really, really? Same with a structural engineer. I, I've never used stone before. We're not trained in structural engineering school to, to use stone. How about if I pretend it's uh, unreinforced um, concrete? So let's get a cost. Our stone mason says it's completely possible. Turns out to be um, cheaper by about 25% than a, a steel column clad with all its insulation and clamps and all the rest of them. So well, fine, it's financially viable then. Structural engineer works out it's structurally uh, possible against progressive collapse. And again, if you're interested, we'll, we'll come, come to that later. So what's the next question? Well, what's the, um, what's, what are the finishes? How do we dress it? What is this 21st century dressing? We visit a quarry to have a look how the stone's extracted, what its ultimate finishes are, and the minimal amount of finishes from these small scale quarries is saw cutting, sedimentary layer, and drilling with the occasional ammonite shell and quartz pocket. Well, a structural engineer, we work out that an exoskeleton, just like the metal exoskeleton, can just have a simple metal boss at the back of it clamped into the floor plane. Um, that's it going up, all on temporary props, and then the exoskeleton comes on and the props are taken away. Sorry. Inter oops. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Am I getting backwards or forward? Uh, does it matter? It's almost coming to the end. Um, that was just a plan. The idea was uh, that you can see there, it's an open plan with no um, internal columns because you know the columns are on the outside, uh, which basically means you can have all timber partitions, all timber structures, no plasterboard, no aluminium partitions, all the rest of it. Uh, and you can just clear those out so it's loose fit. So in the future, if you wanted to change its use, smaller units, hotel offices, you can without, without any major disruption. Blue, green roof for the top. Again, you can ask questions. My God, how much did I put into this? Uh, more stone research. Yes, sorry, there. Right. What we discovered on, um, on Clerkenwell was quite a dramatic um, um, uh, uh, drop in embodied carbon 
in using a stone exoskeleton. So a direct comparison with um, a steel frame was quite dramatic. Um, our, our sustainability engineer modeled it, then did his final assessment, and he said, you've saved 90 odd percent on, um, on the embodied carbon. I had no idea how. Uh, next, he said, fair me back when you've worked it out. And of course, it's because stone is just sitting there, isn't it? It's, it's, it has no embodied energy. The embodied energy is in the cutting, transportation, and erection on site. So we, we extrapolated this into a, for, the, for the stone exhibition. Yeah, God, let's go back. Um, stone, stone, stone exhibition. Uh, I was going to show you a stone tower. Oh, there you go. Right. Uh, uh, 30 stories tall. Um, there you go. Sorry. Sorry for numb bottom. Um, um, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, for, we extrapolated it for a 30 story tower instead of a six story tower. Um, and what we found was that, um, that um, scenario one where everything is stone, stone exoskeleton, stone tension floor slabs. Um, you can see if you run your finger along um, to the, um, this is the all steel option, steel frame um, uh, with, with its stone cladding. It's quite a fraction of the overall steel. If it was concrete frame with stone cladding, again, a fraction of that. The next scenario occurred to us because it was a stone exhibition, it was meant to be all stone. And we said, well, actually, let's try and mix it with a bit of cross laminated timber or mass timber exoskeleton, but all the floor plates and internal partitions are timber. It, because of timber's carbon sequestration, it ends up being negative. And if you look at that, it's more negative than the concrete is positive. Similarly, our, our cost engineers, it's, you know, people think uh, money is a dirty word for architecture, but I would suggest that it's, that is part of your ethical framework. Um, I mean, examples I use is if you're, user, if you're doing any um, projects for affordable housing providers, um, charities, etc. One project we, we found out the overall construction cost was about 25% less than, than, than conventional costs that they were expecting, their QS was expecting. And of course, um, if you're a commercial developer, that's great. But if you're a social housing provider, what that means is every four projects, you suddenly get your fifth for free. So you have to phrase it like that. So for them to immediately understand that um, it's, um, it's an advantage, isn't it? You've innovated and you've given them an advantage for their charitable purposes. So what we find here with our cost consultant is that, uh, where are we? Um, most expensive is concrete, steel is next down, um, all stone is next down from that. And the cheapest of all is, I mean, it's only eight, 10% cheaper stone and timber, but still significant if you're, we got the brief from Canary Wharf just to challenge them that um, uh, if you were building, you know, give us give us a um, ideal brief for yourselves in height and scale to just demonstrate to them it's worthwhile. So Canary Wharf could be, or if you're a commercial developer, the first to build a carbon negative um, uh, tower. Obviously, after that, it's the the operation of it that you have to control. This is something we are trying to do with a small scale building, smaller scale building, and then that in, um, in eventually. And I'm just finishing off here on bits of research of stone that we can, if you're interested, we can always come back to. Okay, so just one last slide that needs explanation. If, if that is the um, sort of roughly the minimal amount of timber you need for a three bedroom house to generate enough structural timber for that, uh, you need about two hectares of um, woodland, uh, which grows across 20, 30 years. This is not a dichot uh, a sort of, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, it's not an either or. It's not a false dichotomy between timber and stone. It's just to say, use your, choose your materials um, carefully, intelligently, um, because the stone is already beneath our feet. We don't need to wait for it to grow. Obviously, it's not carbon sequestrating. But it's a lot less land to, to grab, as it were, to put your housing up. And if you mix the two, you're still carbon negative. And then similarly for the large towers. And there we conclude.
Thank you very much for that, Armin. I'm just going to stop uh, live video. Make that on. Okay. Cool. Um, so I've got a lot of questions. Sorry, everyone. Um, we, we've also got uh, these roving mics, so I'm going to pass it to you. And if anyone wants to ask a question, you can hand it to them. Thank you. No pressure. <laughs> um, I mean, I've got a lot of questions here. Um, first of all, though, we should say a big thank you to the National Youth Theatre for hosting us um, today. And I think it's pretty clear we talk about the history of buildings and kind of the narrative which is being told by an architect within that. But we can pay attention to the room we're in because we can see the previous life of this building, this once Georgian building. Well, not exactly here, but in the, in the foyer when you walked in, um, the renovation has been done by DSDHA architects, and we'll come back to that uh, maybe in a bit as well. But you, fitting you ended on stone there because, um, and you mentioned that you learn a lot from stone masons. Is how important kind of is that learning practice, the learning process to you and your practice? Is that something you say right? You know, you know what team we need to we need to learn from how these people make and craft materials, mm -hmm. and then that's going to hopefully inform our project down the line. It is. Uh, I guess you should ask, how did that first start and why? It wasn't, mm. it wasn't so much um, us thinking, well, we need to become craftsmen or, or, or um, uh, have an affinity with craft. It's more fundamental than that. Um, all of us will recognize that when we design something and it goes out to um, design team, normal processes we design. I mean, dare I say, I'm, just, I'm sort of uh, uh, shortening it but uh, often inside, uh, outside in. So we will design the plans and obviously the elevations and hand it over to a design team, a structural engineer with the concrete survey will say, well, uh, concrete's cheaper or steel is cheaper this year. Let's put a steel frame or concrete frame in. Sensible location for the columns of such and such. Mm -hmm. The process goes on and on, iterations. Eventually the concrete survey says, okay, I think it's all on budget. Let's go out to tender. And I think all of us know that nothing ever comes back under tender, bang on tender. It's always 15%, 20%, 40% worse. Yeah. And then there's every, everyone's tearing their hair out, doing what's called value engineering. And of course, the value engineering is never, or can we take out 25% of the structural columns? Can we take out the, um, mm. the, the heating system or the water supply? It's apparent the architect has over-designed and over-detailed it. So you strip away the, the architecture, the, what the architect thinks is the architecture the image as it were uh, so for us it was more fundamental to say well why don't we make the architecture irreducible so it, 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 as with any structure engineer or any engineer you try to remove it and the building will fall down it is one and the same thing it's integral mm -hmm. the structure and um, an architecture are one as it were how do you do that well yes you work with the, with the design team more fundamentally but actually why don't you go and t chat to the people that make it so, because most contractors, pretty much all main contractors, very few of them actually roll up their sleeves and are on site. We work with some who, who are like that. But almost all of them are very highly qualified managers. Mm. I'm not diminishing that in any way. Uh, uh, as such, they go off to subcontractors for almost everything. So why don't you go off to subcontractors and hear from the horse's mouth? We, this is our idea. You tell us, how much is it going to cost? Well, it's going to cost this much. Oh, dear, that's um, a bit over budget. Uh, so we already know it's over budget well before um, going out to tender. What have we done? Well, why are you using twice the amount of metal or whatever it is Then you need to? Oh, really? How, how, how do we use half, half the amount? Well, yeah, they'll sketch it for you. Uh, mm -hmm. and is that still roughly your design intent? Well, it sort of is. But had we realized you could make it with less, is it possible to do it another way? Would it work like this? So there's a dialogue that, mm -hmm. that is established where maybe your eye, your uh, um, overall um, um, encompassing eye for, for the, the overall, as it were, and how it might shift. Also the possibility that you just might bin the idea and start mm -hmm. again. Uh, uh, um, has that dialogue with the, the real makers mm -hmm. and they're educating you. Uh, so it comes from that mm -hmm. as opposed to the initial point of uh, something more aesthetic. It's, it's, um, yeah, 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 okay. But you, you, for that to be a success, you have to mm -hmm. have many, many stakeholders on board with that mm -hmm. process. Yeah. And you know, when you go out to, when you speak to contractors and indeed the client, mm -hmm. 
at what point do you introduce that your that way of building well, like to... all these things you have to triangulate your argument so yeah. um clients are inevitably you know they're paying for it they're um, mm. uh, uh, um, is this going to be cheaper how much cheaper is it worth me taking the risk what is the risk mm. can I, will this be insured is there a warranty you have to meet all those so you have to satisfy all those and of course if it's cheaper and faster yeah. it has, <laughs> satisfies all those warranties the client is normally on board pretty quickly as, as are the rest of the design team especially mm-hmm. if you know if you're doing housing new housing it's nhbc and blp it's not very difficult to get them into the office or obviously today in some other form to look across those ideas and details and say yes they are not the traditional robust details that you come out of a catalog but it does exactly what we expect it to do they might even in the past they've actually influenced the design as well as so why don't you swap the waterproofing from this side to that side and it's fine with us mm-hmm. and we will adopt it and warrant it at that point everyone's on board the only person who's not on board yet is the main contractor so the manager yeah. because they then have to adopt the risk under their overall warranty same, yeah. not even if the warranties are are elsewhere and that's all what we find is the last hurdle very very frustrating <laughs> the last hurdle <laughs> Well, it's got to be done, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. That, that approach and in the work you kind of alert, um, highlighted there it celebrates kind of the messy nature of construction to an extent. Mm. Like you mentioned, you, know, you cut the, the concrete that you can't finish. And indeed, mm. the, the stone on Clark and Will Close, it comes that's straight out of the quarry and yeah. some parts of it are unfinished. Yeah. Yeah. Is, the risk there is that you, know, you, can't, you can't decide how that looks. Mm. Mm. And yeah how are you kind of introducing people to that risk? Because unfortunately, Clark and Will Close, I mean, mm. you, you likened in a conversation with me a while ago that it was essentially someone complaining about knots in the wood, which yeah, you can't yeah, predict. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, yes. Uh, let me start with that. Uh, and I would start with the idea that uh, we have inadvertently walked into a planning system that is um, uh, misaligned with the architect's appointment. So the architect's appointment, you are paid up to stage three, mm-hmm. uh, as it is now. Uh, um, you're paid to do that uh, up to, mm. so you're producing drawings of a certain scale. Those drawings will never be the one to five details, unless you as an architect decide what to hell with it, I'm going to do them anyway. Yeah. Planners aren't really interested in them, but you might present them and, and, and uh, good for you if you do. That might be one way of doing it. But really, you're being paid to produce drawings of one to a hundred, if it's a conservation area, maybe one to 20 uh, a condition point, pre-commencement condition point, mm. but you're not being, and it's suitable for mass produced products where you can definitely say, yeah, like anything mass produced, it will be essentially that color mm. understood. Everybody understands the, you know, even bricks and let's become an absolute uniform. Well, we understand a brick is a brick and there's going to be some mm. small variation. But yes, for anything that's um, as dramatically varied as um, that stone, it's you know, it's new. It hasn't been done before. It will be a shock. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that kind of comes down to like celebrating imperfections as, you know, yeah. as well. And yeah, yeah. Kind of. How, I mean, in your studio, do you tie that approach back to kind of the theory that was kind of postulated by kind of Ruskin when he talks about kind of the quote from him? I have is the history of architecture is in the last inch. Yeah, yeah. Um, well. In the sense that it's celebrating the 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 hand of um, of the, the quarry master, the stonemason, mm-hmm. and ours is almost invisible. Uh, ultimately, the finishes are theirs. The architecture is theirs. Mm-hmm. We have helped compose it with a structural engineer. Uh, in that sense, uh, without saying it is, uh, because you could read it the other way and say to the inch, to the you know, to the millimeter is our. Um, mm. The English sort of um, fetish with details that perhaps <laughs> on the continent they don't have. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, how important to you? Why is it so important to you, rather, to be kind of tectonically honest? No, I, I th- that's a very good question because uh, uh, for a long time, morality in, mm. in the materials, uh, honesty to materials, um, especially if we think of um, Watkin and morality in architecture. Mm. Uh, uh, the, the overlaying of that idea is that, well, there shouldn't be. These are inert materials. Why do they have any moral uh, uh, purpose or, mm-hmm. or, or understanding? They don't. Um, and nevertheless, this is why I say there is a, um, mm. an, an ethical framework 
that gives us what we then just put values and if, if if you like to call them moral but let's just call them ethical values purpose and what are they well yes it's it's uh, uh, it stands up doesn't burst into flames keeps the weather <laughs> out um it's cheaper and therefore a social housing provider can build an extra one for every four etc these are all things that um mm. uh, as well as having low body carbon these are all things that have if you like a morality to them um, mm. a value to them well there's also kind of the, the the ethics behind the extractive nature of our extractive na- nature of architecture in, in terms of extracting material from the mm, land as well mm, exactly yeah. um i was going to ask you know is it if anyone in the audience now has a question there's a chance to raise your hand oh, come on i know some of you might just bored you to tears <laughs> um what else did i have here i put quite a lot and i'm trying to whistle it down to, to quite a few of them um Oh uh, yeah, you, you you talked about that the, the pavilion at Lords. I was wondering. Oh, uh, did I? That yeah. wasn't me. That was Edward R. Ford. <laughs> yeah, well, Edward R. Ford. Yeah, well. Yeah. I was wondering if you can. Yeah, it's get... difficult, that isn't it? Because uh, yeah. all I'm presenting is Edward R. Ford's. Um, you know, there's a con- uh, there's yet another it's that perennial question that we all have, and Edward yeah. R. Ford's doing it again for 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 our generation, as it were. While yeah. previous generations are also asking the same questions, mm. we are looking at it. To, uh, the, the, we well, we understand architecture as image. Is that how we should be understanding it? And he's asking that same question. It should be tectonic. Although he's not rev- quite going as far as Semper and saying um, yeah. it's you know emblematic of, of a particular period, but he's asking fundamentally the same question. And we should all be asking that. And the reason we ask is because we're not trained. We're, we're trained top-down image as opposed to pro- product, process to product, as it were. Yeah. We wouldn't be asking had we, if we were trained that way. It, wouldn't, it would never occur to us. Yeah. Yes, it's true, but it, maybe it would occur to us if one was an apprentice. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, that's a whole kind of yeah. question on, on pedagogy, yeah. which the LSA is trying to answer yeah. as much as anyone Precisely. else. Precisely. Precisely. Yeah. Um, but going back, going back to Semper, I mean, uh, he was obviously interested in the, the primitive hut and indeed Logier's, Logier's mm-hmm. idea of the primitive hut, but Logier didn't represent the primitive hut in any particular way. Like mm-hmm. that, that drawing mm-hmm. was not. Um, on the cover of, of, of the book was well, not true to an extent. Mm. Yeah. So, I, well, I mean, I'm kind yeah. of want to unpack the connection between our Ford, Semper, Primitive Heart, mm. and then indeed yeah, yeah. the yeah. process you have. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, it's, it's a no, big old no, meter question. No, no, well, I'm just, uh, I, mm, yeah, it's a difficult one because. Um, uh, I mean, what I'd say is all of us read and uh, take, read things in a particular way and take from those mm-hmm. almost what we want uh, to not necessarily um, rationalize what's in our mind, what's dimly there and, um, and crystallize it. Uh, but we dispense with potentially a lot of other things. Mm. And I'm not, I have to confess, I'm not that interested in the, 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 um, uh, 18th century and 19th century searches for uh, for for the etymology of architecture mm-hmm. in the same way that they are and the same root and the same result. Uh, I, I uh, um, yeah, I, I'd like to think that yeah, yeah. we've done a lot since, and I we can actually we don't need to do that. But your your architecture is telling a story of construction and an, it indeed is. of history. It is, yeah, yeah. of yeah. construction. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. in those areas, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm really cautious of time, and we have quite a lot of kind of drink outside to kind of get through. So I think on that note, I will say thank you to everyone for for coming, and thank you to Armin for your time, and thank you to the National Youth Theatre and to Stowe for their support of these talks. Thank you.